Hi guys, welcome back to another tutorial on Apache Cassandra. In this tutorial, we're going to start looking at partitioning rings and tokens in Apache Cassandra. So in the last video, we looked at Cassandra's query first approach and how each query should be handled by a single table in the database. In this tutorial, we're going to look at how Cassandra decides what data it stores on what nodes or what machines in the cluster. We want to be able to satisfy queries in the most performant way possible. So this usually involves accessing as few nodes or as few servers as possible per request. So the optimal strategy is to know exactly what node and ideally one node contains the data we want to access. And when we're performing writes, we want to be able to just write to one single table at a time. So Cassandra achieves this by partitioning the data on something called a partition key. Every piece of data with the same partition key will be stored on the same node in the cluster. So if we look at our previous table of employee by car make, in this case, the car make would be the partition key. So we want to be sure that all the data with the partition key BMW, i.e. these three rows here, are stored on the same node in the cluster. So that way, when we do a query, say, get all employees who drive a BMW, we'll be able to access these three rows very quickly because they're guaranteed to be stored on the same node in our cluster. The same can be said for the company car by ID table. In this table, the partition key is the company car by ID. Because we are accessing by the ID of the company car, each query should only return one record. So for instance, if we want to get the company car by ID one, only this record should be returned. If we want to get the company car by ID three, only this record should be returned. In this case, because we are only returning one record at a time, this data could be distributed among many nodes and it would not make any difference to performance. But we still need to have a partition key for the table, which we choose as the ID here. This allows us to access the data. It's also important to note the difference between a partition key and a primary key. This is most apparent in the employee by car make table. In the employee by car make table, the partition key is the first row here, in this case, car make. Note that this does not have to be unique per record. This simply decides on which node the data will be stored. The second row, which represents the ID of the employee, is more similar to a primary key like we would see in a relational database. In Cassandra, we should only access data using the partition key. The primary key can still be part of the table, but is just for returning the value as part of our query. If we want to access a data by its primary key, we should create a new table in Cassandra to allow for that query. The table would look similar to the company car by ID table, where we use the primary key as the partition key. So how does Cassandra achieve this partitioning? For each partition key, say in this case, BMW, Cassandra passes the partition key through what's known as a hash function. And the purpose of a hash function is to turn every partition key or every string into a unique ID. So BMW in this case could be transformed into something like 234. So when we pass BMW through the hash function, we'll get 234. And say we get another partition key, in this case, Audi. Again, we want to pass each partition key when we're adding the data to their database through the hash function. And in this case, we'll get something different, say 134. And then again with the Merck, we want to add a new Merck to our database table. We pass the partition key through the hash function and we get a completely new value, 569 here. So that's how Cassandra uses the partition key and the hash function to generate an ID for every new line of data in the database. So say we want to add another employee by the car they drive, in this case, they drive a BMW. Again, we'll pass it to our hash function, which we'll just abbreviate as HF here. So in this case, we'll get an ID of 234. So the interesting thing to note here is that 
both of the BMWs generate the same hash when we pass through the hash function because we've used the same partition key. And this is the unique characteristic or what the hash function is expected to do because the BMW and the BMW generate the same hash key when passed through the hash function. This is what Cassandra uses to decide that these two pieces of data will go on the same node in our cluster. In Cassandra, these values are known as tokens. And as we said, it is these tokens that Cassandra uses to decide on which node the data will be stored. In real Cassandra, these tokens will be 64-bit integers. And they'll have a range between minus 2 to the 63 and 2 to the 63, positive 2 to the 63, minus 1. So we've looked at how Cassandra uses the hash function and partition keys to generate a unique token for every piece of data that we want to store in our database. So how does Cassandra then use that token to decide which node in the cluster the data will be stored on? So this diagram here is called the Cassandra ring diagram, and it represents all the nodes on our cluster. In this case, we have a five node cluster with one, two, three, four, five nodes represented by the green circles on the cluster. So each node will be assigned a token and it will be responsible for storing data less than the value of that token, but greater than the value of the token assigned to the previous node. So for instance, node one will be assigned the token range up to 10. So anything less than 10 and greater than the token assigned to the previous node, which in this case is five, which we will get to at the end of the ring, will be assigned to node one. So the token assigned to node two will be 20, which means that anything less than 20, but greater than the previous node's token, which is 10, will be assigned to node two. So any token, that we pass through the hash value and results in a token between 10 and 20 will be assigned to node two. Node three's token will be up to 30. And so again, any token less than 30, but greater than 20, i.e. greater than two's token will be assigned to node three. The same for node four, it has a token up to 40. And in that case, again, less than 40, but greater than 30 should be assigned to node four. And the same for node five. So that will wrap around up here, up to the value of zero. So this zero here, I suppose, also represents, say, between 50 and zero. So any token between 40 and 50 will be assigned to five, but any token between zero and 10 will be assigned to node one. In Cassandra, the tokens will range between minus two to the 63 and plus two to the 63 minus one and this will wrap around the entire range of the ring. So if we want to add a record to the database from our employees by car make table, the partition key could be BMW. We will pass this to our hash function, and this will result in the hash, say in this example of 15. Now this doesn't always have to be 15, but for BMW, if we pass this to our hash function, we should always get the same value of 15. Because 15 lies between 20 and 10, this record will be added to node number two in our database. So next, if a Audi comes along, an employee who drives an Audi, and because Audi is our pit partition key, that's what we're using to decide which node the data will be stored on. Again, we pass it through our hash function, and we will get a token of 43. So 43 is between 40 and 50. So this piece of data or this record will be assigned to node five, And say if we get another BMW or another employee who drives a BMW, again, we'll pass to our hash function. In this case, we should get the same value as the previous because every string that we pass into our hash function that is the same should result in the same value of the token. So we'll get 15 again. And we know that 15 lies less than 20 and greater than 10. So this will now lie on node two or node two will store the data for BMW. So this is what allows us to quickly make queries such as get me all employees who drive a BMW because we know and Cassandra knows that all of the data we want will lie on the same node, in this case two. 
So finally, we will look at the idea of virtual nodes in Cassandra. So in real life, Cassandra usually doesn't just apply one big token range to a single node. So in this case, the token range between zero and 10 is quite small, but in reality, that will be between zero and a very large number. So Cassandra doesn't want to apply the, a token range such large to a single node. So what it does is it actually provides multiple token ranges to the same node. And this is called virtual nodes. So in this case, there could be a number of virtual nodes, each with a different token range, two, four, six, and eight. Any data that falls inside these token ranges will still be assigned to node number one. But these virtual nodes provide greater flexibility in the system. It makes the process of assigning tokens to nodes less manual, which means it is much easier for Cassandra to add new nodes to the cluster, which is one of the main advantages of Cassandra is that we can very seamlessly add more nodes to our cluster to provide greater throughput and greater data storage capacity. It also means that if the nodes in our cluster have different capacities, say for instance, node one is much more powerful than node two, we can assign node one more virtual nodes than node two, and thus node one will be able to store more data and process more data. So in this case, say for instance, node one has 256 gigabytes of storage, and node two has only 64 gigabytes of storage, we might assign node one eight virtual nodes while we would only assign node two two virtual nodes. And this is configurable inside Cassandra. In the default Cassandra deployment, every node or every node range has 256 virtual nodes. This is the default for a node, but can be changed and can be configured through Cassandra configuration.